Eastern Market Corporation. He will discuss the market's amazing 170-year history. I think he's still running on adrenaline. What do you think, folks? Should we have him lap the room three times just to calm down? I'm good, I'm good. From cemeteries to breweries, rum running to art galleries, and safe houses to prisons, hear about the many privately owned wholesale and retail specialty stores and ethnic food shops located in the 43-acre area that provide various food and specialty products. We were kind of joking that perhaps there would be samples, and that's why we had so many people registering. But I think the very fact we have Dan is fabulous. So please welcome Dan. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, traffic was heavy, and the officer was very kind. He <laughs> rode for only 10 miles over the limit. So, so I can talk into a mic, or I can walk around, but I can't do both. So you're going to, I can't stand still. So you're going to, it's a little bit challenge for the cameraman. OK, you up for it? Good. <laughs> Pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about Easter Market. Before you do that, how I got the Easter Market. Um, and I think we all have. Um, food stories in our families that are pretty interesting. And for most of us, um, I'll be 60, 59 this April. You know you get old when you can't remember how old you're gonna be when your birthday turns. And I would say we, I don't know, however many other 60-ish year olds are in the crowd, but I would say we grew up in an era where food in this country is probably taken more for granted than any other time in the history of mankind. I don't know of another time where widespread we didn't have to think about as much about food on a daily basis as during the last 60 years. Um, but my family came, I'm, I'm here uh, in the Midwest because of potatoes, because in the 1840s, both sides of my family were forced from Ireland because of the famine. And food wasn't taken for granted there. In fact, over the course of five or six years, the population of Ireland fell from, some say as high as 11 million, I think there was a little bit of Irish hyperbole, but uh, a good four or five million people either starved or emigrated because of the failure of the potato crop. Now, when I was younger, I thought a little bit about food uh, and biology. I thought that was kind of mostly the result of just monoculturalism, one over-dependence on one plant. Uh, but really, there's a much deeper and more interesting story there. Uh, two years before the, the famine sets in, before the potato, potato blight sets in, the British Parliament changed its laws about the importation, agricultural tariffs were dropped from importation from Ireland into, and Scotland into England. And so all of a sudden, if you're a, uh, I still think it's better live, I don't, isn't it? Thing. Sorry, audience agrees. So um, I'm a former tavern keeper, so I speak really loudly. If you can't hear me, raise your hand, OK? Because I am. Can you hear me now? He really can't hear me. <laughs> and really, I am legally deaf, so if he can't hear me, I'll try one more time. Can you hear me now? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. See, it's going to be too loud. Yeah. All right. So all of a sudden, he, I think he thought I said, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. Or if you can't hear me, raise your hand. So. The situation in, in Ireland went, if you were a landlord there and you had a lot of serfs farming your, your ground, it was kind of a benefit until you could now import or export sheep or, or lamb or, or beef or export crops to England. And so all of a sudden, people became a less desirable tenant on your land than livestock. And during the famine, exports of agricultural products from Ireland to England actually skyrocketed while people were starving. So food has often been used as a tool. Uh, it, it's, it's not taken for granted in a lot of places. So I grew up in Chicago, Oak Park, uh, home of Frank Lloyd Wright, Ernest Hemingway, and my favorite, Sam Giancana, the notorious mobster, who I used to trick or treat at his house. And it was a very normal house for the neighborhood, very much like those. Picture there. I am, the police did shake me up, sorry. Much like that picture there, except he had a, one of those rubber nibbed welcome mats. You know, they were either in green or red. Remember those? His simply, it was a custom made one. It simply said, unwelcome. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, when I was about 13, my dad started doing business 
out in western Iowa with a company that had failed in pork pa uh, packing, a company that would, would, would go on to become the Iowa Beef Packers, now the Beef Division of Tyson Foods, the single largest meat packing industry in the world, completely revolutionizing how beef made its way from feedlot to family farm table. Prior to that, cattle got fed, they got put on mostly um, trains, a few trucks, shipped to big cities like Kansas City, Chicago, South St. Paul, and where the slaughterhouses were at near the stockyards. Remember that? People are old enough to remember that, I think. This is the first one, about two miles from the, what became the Car Carmody family farm for about 20 years. They built their first plant in a rural place. And they cut it up and they made it an industrial process and put it in a box and shipped it on trucks. And within about five years, that one company put about 35,000 UAW butchers out of work. It was revolutionary. And now all beef is most, more or less slaughtered in that fashion. But for us, as our odyssey of uh, uh, this urban, rural life that I had that kind of led me to Eastern Market, uh, how many of you are old enough to remember uh, Green Acres? <laughs> this is a really interesting, if you, if you ask this question amongst college students, nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> so I don't know what's in syndication on the cartoon or on the, the sitcom channels, but apparently Eddie Albert and Zsa Zsa Gavor are not. Now, our experiment ended a little better than that of uh, Green Acres, but it was still city people learning how to farm, and it was, had its hysterical moments. Uh, I was born young enough of three brothers that I just saw how much hard work was involved, and eventually my dad had to sell the farm because he had had another industrial project that fell apart, that he had to use the proceeds from the sale of the farm to keep his main business going. But for about 10 years, we were farmers, and it gave me a chance for a city boy to see how much work was involved, and as, partly as a result, I became a city planner. Went to the University of Illinois and mostly had a very transformative year in the, at Manchester, England, where I saw Rust Belt up close and personal for the first time. Really, the, the Rust Belt recession hadn't hit the United States yet. That would come in the mid-80s when Detroit and all of these other industrial cities in the Midwest started to fly apart rather than just falling apart as they had been since the 50s. And uh, I fell in love with the idea of what do you do with these old hulking metropolitan areas which were built for one industry and suddenly it's gone. It's a riddle that we still wrestle with today throughout the Midwest, which starts in Connecticut and stretches all the way into Nebraska. So when I became a city planner, I, started, I moved to a place called Rock Island, Illinois. Where when I moved there, they made all the red tractors. Our international harvester uh, was based there, their tractor production capacity. And uh, there was a time in history in a place where on one side of a street, which was Rock Island, Illinois, they made all the red tractors. And across the street was Moline, Illinois, where they made all the green tractors. And they had the, the logistics yards for Deer and Company and International Harvester side by side. It was a beautiful Christmas scene. And in 1985, that International Harvester shut down a million and a half square foot of, which represented half of the worldwide production capacity for tractors, disappeared overnight, never came back. And along with its 6,000 UAW uh, jobs in a, in a place of about, the town population is about 40,000. So it was devastating. Uh, so I was a downtown development guy, kind of like Christy Chemerov here in uh, Rochester. Uh, and I got tired of talking people into trying to open businesses in my downtown. So I resigned from being a city planner. And actually, my brother and I, my dad, for a few years until he passed away, built a chain of six-bar restaurants. So I like to say I was schooled as a city planner, but educated as a barkeep. <laughs> uh, because you really learn about people. I woke up about mid-30s, 10 years later. Four-bar restaurant nightclubs, three children underneath the age of five, and I learned to what the concept of sustainability was all about. Not a very sustainable system. So I went back halfway. I became a, a downtown guy, a placemaker. So taking places like this, ravaged by not really the bad times. Let's be truthful. What happened to Detroit, what happened to all the industrial cities in America, is they collapsed because of the complacency of the good times. This downtown only started getting better when people realized this was an asset we had to take advantage of if we wanted to rebuild a, a more different economy than the one we just had. And so in 10 years, we were able to make some profound changes. And so for me, after 18 years in the same place, I kind of, all my ideas were old. So I went to a place where all my ideas were new again, Fort Wayne, Indiana, found the house of our dreams, but took a weekend trip to Detroit. And this is what we saw. And how could you go back after you've seen the promised land? <laughs> how could you go back after you've seen the promised land? I got out of the car. It was a day about this time of year, about as beautiful as today was in the upper Midwest. 
Um, and uh, my, I got this wild-eyed look on my face. And my, my, I got back in the car, and my wife said, well, what would you do if you ever worked here? And I said, I don't know. That's the fun part. And six years to the day later, six weeks to the day later, a headhunter called inquiring about whether I'd be interested in the position or not. So it was one of those awoo moments. So we live uh, not too far from the market in Lafayette Park, uh, and we like it very much there. So let's talk about the market. We go back to 1891. This is from a presentation. We had some students from in, in Illinois Institute of Technology, which was where Mies van der Rohe taught, who designed Lafayette Park. That's why those two slides are in there. The market uh, has featured two primary products since 1891, good food and conviviality. And I would argue that I'll talk mostly today about food. But is that an Illinois fan I see back there? Yeah. Remember, remember when we were in the Big Ten playing football and basketball? <laughs> Ah, those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> Someday again. Um, we'll talk mostly today about food, but the conviviality, the social capital, the people coming together, that's why you guys go there. I mean, those, how many have been to the market? Yeah, you, go, you can buy plants and flowers and food a lot of places, but that feeling you get when you, you, you see people from all walks of life, all races, all ages, suburban, urban, it doesn't happen enough organically in the metropolitan area. It may happen in a, at a festival, it may happen on the big light, bright night, Christmas show, when we kind of contrived sort of c civic living, but it happens every Saturday. And I, and I've, as a downtown guy, I've traveled well over in North America and a little bit into Europe, but there really is no other place like Eastern Market in North America on a Saturday morning when it's a relatively warm outside. <laughs> so those two products are very important. We're also not one market, we're a collection of markets. So the other great uh, markets that are remaining from the olden days in the United States, like Pike Place Market in Seattle, or um, Faneuil Hall in Boston, or Eastern Market in Washington, D.C. You know why we're called Eastern Market, don't you? There used to be a Western Market. There used to be a Central Market. There used to be a Chain Ferry Market. There actually used to be an organization in the city of Detroit called the Bureau of Public Markets. And uh, we're the last one standing. So when we have people from Eastern Michigan come to, to the market, I tell them, we were a lot like you are now, but we eliminated our competition. <laughs> you can. Um, for those world travelers, my favorites are Bar Torino and Barcelona. They both have 40-ish public markets still to this day. It's a whole different way of organizing much of the retail economy in big cities. And it is profoundly different. If you go to Spain and compare what happened in Madrid, which has been conservative and capitalistic more than the uh, Catalonian region around Barcelona, you have Tesco, in, which is the Kmart, uh, Sam's Club, uh, Sam's Club version, really, if you, hypermarkets, dominate Madrid. You've got 45 public markets, unlike Eastern Market, with uh, actually permanent vendors. And they've only started adding grocery stores, chains, national retailers in the last few years as ad ad adjacent pieces to these thriving private markets, public markets. So here, though, we're unique. We stand out because unlike our other brethren in big markets, which are typically what my favorite other one besides where I work is Westside Market in Cleveland, which is a fabulous hall. But all of those other markets are usually one building, and they're comprised of specialty vendors, permanent, in that they're, they're established and they stay in one place, and they're a normal business, six-day or seven-day-a-week operation. Eastern Market is huge, six blocks, 160,000 square foot. And we, except for a recent shoe shine stand or a shoe repair store, don't have any permanent vendors. Ours are all transient. They come, they go. And it's a collection of markets. So we have a seasonal wholesale market, which operates Monday through Friday, midnight to 5 a.m. It's places where Nino Savaggio's gets its local produce and 20-ish and other, 20 to 30-ish other high-end uh, independent-owned grocers. So we still have a wholesale market for three reasons. One is this diversity of wonderful Michigan agriculture, 150-ish crops grown commercially. That's quite an achievement. The, the state, the chamber types like to say, we're second only to California. And the truth is, there's about six states that are close to California. We're in that second tier. <laughs> Those other states, however, are not proximate to either the great indoor production and uh, other regular outdoor production in Ontario, which is the fruit and vegetable capital of Canada, not too far from here. 
and they're not as proximate to the great Amish Mennonite belt that stretches across the upper Midwest, northern, northwestern Ohio into northeast Indiana. So I would argue that if you like locally grown food, especially now with the drought in California, you all may be living in the best place in North America to not have to reinvent agriculture, but actually just to use the agriculture that's around us. So we have about 40-ish vendors. This is what the market was built for in 1891. It was a six-day week wholesale market. It had hundreds of, if not thousands, of, of vendors. And so this thing still exists, but it's shrunk, it's atrophied. And with the interest in local food, we're now, we've flatlined. We're not losing share anymore. Although at the grocery level, we talked about the diversity of <coughs> <coughs> Michigan agriculture. Detroit gets beat up for being a food desert, like there's no good grocery stores in Detroit. But what people often miss is that in Metro Detroit, we probably have the best collection of independent grocers in the country. Papa Joe's, Nina Savaggio's, Joe's Produce, Plum Markets, Whole Foods. Is, it's like just another place here in this market. And so those are the buyers. And then we're there, the third reason, and maybe the most important, ultimately we'll test it hopefully soon, is that we weren't gentrified into being a fun place of bars, boutiques, and lofts like all the other similar districts in cities like New York and Chicago and San Francisco, the more successful cities. So we're still there because of the collapse of the real estate market in Detroit and because we have buyers and we have sellers. Now the Saturday market is what you probably know us for. How many people come besides Flower Day weekend? <laughs> Excellent. So a lot of people think, like, first of all, that we just have flowers on Flower Day and that the only reason we go to Eastern Market is for plants and flowers. But we like to think there's a year-round full of reasons to come there. And uh, we really are trying to figure out ways, not so much to increase the number of people who come, but to increase the number of times you want to come. So adding new features, making it more compelling. So instead of coming two or three times a year, you want to come four or five times a year, so on and so forth. Uh, but the year-round Saturday market, as many as 30 to 40,000 people, as many as 250 vendors, changes with the seasons, big on plants and flowers. Our busiest time of year is Mother's Day to Father's Day. Uh, we started a Tuesday market, which is seasonal. It's a much smaller, more intimate kind of a lifestyle wellness market, if you will. So we have one shed filled with a nice cross-section of food vendors and one shed that's dedicated to yoga and exercise and food and nutrition outreach classes where we try to bring together a healthier living. And it's a much more, seniors love it. And we get a lot of kids, we got to do a lot of programming at Detroit Public Schools. Talk about that in a little bit. And then this year we add a Sunday market, the second busiest shopping day of the year. And really the root of this idea comes from a trip that the Kellogg, excuse me, the Kresge Foundation sent us to Torino to study their public markets. 30% of the soft goods, the clothes in Torino are sold at their public markets. What are the Italians good at besides sex and wine <laughs> and crime? <laughs> well, it's related to the last one. I grew up in an Irish Italian neighborhood, so I feel it was fair game for either side to take each other on. Matter of fact, I played center in football, uh, and I looked to the left one day, and it was Rubino, Taglia, Shive, Castro, Carmody, Fitzgerald, Dwyer, Stapleton. <laughs> that was what we called segregation in you know, <laughs> But they're really good at the informal economy, the gray economy, the underground economy, if you will. And I would argue that in places like Detroit, first of all, since 2008, um, entrepreneurship and the informal economy is a much bigger part of our economy than it was. It's likely to stay big. And in a place like Detroit with 40 to 60 percent effective unemployment in some of the neighborhoods, people all haven't been just killing each other and doing drugs. There's actually a lot of informal economy taking place. And we need to use the market as a better place to try to bring those people into the real economy. So the Sunday market is about empowering those people who don't make food products at all or don't grow food, but actually make stuff. And so it's kind of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Brooklyn flea market, it's kind of a hipster version of, uh, a way hipster version of say, uh, what are those big flea corrals they have? There's the one on, in Monroe and one up in Macomb County. Yeah, you know, it's a big gap between those two things, but so, we, we want to be somewhat closer to, without being quite as uh, hipsterish as the Detroit one. But to make, to, for people to sell unique things, flea market items, some, yes. Collectibles, yes. Antiques, some. 
We want to feature all those great things that are made in Detroit, like all the car clubs and the, and the tractor and farm implement clubs, so they can show their prized possessions off. And then we're building a kitchen, one of our projects I'll talk a lot about. Uh, the goal is to actually have a signature Sunday brunch where we invite faith groups each Sunday to bring not only the recipes, but also their musical ministries. And so we offer really a signature Sunday brunch. So it's a mix of things that says Detroit, but it's not diluting the Saturday market by trying to be the same kind of market as the Saturday market. So we, we kicked that off this year. We reckon it'll take us three years to kind of build it out to its full potential. And one of my favorite tasks, I don't know if you uh, any Lions fans in the crowd, but we're, we're also the single largest Lions tailgating site eight Sundays a year. So how the Sunday market and tailgating intersect is one of the great mysteries that we will soon unravel. <laughs> so our goal at the, the, the market is old. The nonprofit that I've been, had the luxury of leading since 2007 is fairly recent. It started in 2006. It was a 10-year battle to wrestle it away from the cold, cold grip of the Detroit City Council. And uh, there is no criticism of the rec Recreation Department to manage the market. I would just like to say that when it comes to a, whether it's a downtown development authority like you have here, uh, when you put a nonprofit with a single purpose to the task, it creates attention to the job that needs to be done. I cannot imagine my life, the recreation department director, focusing at all on Eastern Market if you had 150 properties to maintain and a budget that was being decimated every year. Eastern Market just didn't get any attention. So by putting a nonprofit to the task of it, it created us the opportunity to focus and bring new resources to the table. So you guys been in the market, I have a little video that is duplicative if you've been there. Now, we started out to do three things in 2006. Run the market, seek funding to um, construct capital improvements at the market, and serve as the downtown-like economic development organization for the neighborhood called Eastern Market, which is bounded by I-75, <coughs> Chain, Gratiot, and Mac. In the time since then, this whole interest in local food has kind of washed ashore. So there's two additional functions that we now do that weren't really in people's mind when we separated from the city. Number one is uh, serve as a regional hub to try to bring more food production, bring, bring more employment to food to the region. And secondly, to work on food access issues. So this critique of big ag, again, I go back to my days in Iowa, it, around the campfires that a lot of small ag, and the, there's like two worlds in America, not just Republican and Democrat, but there's agriculture, there's this side of the room will be the big factory commodity industrial ag, those are not pejorative terms, I don't think, and then over here we have the sustainable, organic, and local agriculture. Now this side controls 97% of market share, and this side believes they have 90%, 7% of righteousness on their side. <laughs> well, we serve both. We're one of those places where those two worlds collide. And so while this side doesn't appreciate the two things that this side has done that have been spectacular, they've done it so well, it may be the last, you know, maybe the last best thing that the federal government's ever done was when the first oil embargo hit in 1973, Earl Butts and President Nixon figured out that they were gonna grow American grain to pay the oil bill because the Soviet crops had failed for three years and corn was an all-time high. So Earl Butts, who would later say some infamous things, uh, said, we're gonna plant fence row to fence row and we're gonna grow big or we're gonna go home. And so we put big American egg on steroids and became gigongous American egg, and it did feed the world. Now, if you want to see another interesting set of data, and the federal government is really expert at this, it's called unintended consequences. <laughs> if you want to look at an interesting chart, look at American consumption of sugar, 1800 to the present. It goes along with some nice steady increases till about 1982, and then it spikes. And it really only recently started to slow down again. Any guesses as to why? It's because the Soviet crops recovered. And this mountain of American grown corn had no market. And from that became high fructose corn syrups, syrups made, sh sweeteners made from corn. 
because of this artificially very, couldn't give it away. We had to create a new market, and we did, and it's basically bankrupting us. So, but American ag produced record crops. They took all the people out. They mechanized to the point where one and a half percent of the people are called farmers in this country, which having seen the work on a farm, I wouldn't dispute as necessarily a bad thing. And the third thing it did is it reduced the food costs in this country. 2000, 2010 census, under 10%. Lowest in the world, lowest in the history of people on the planet. You go into developing countries, households are paying 70, 80 percent of their annual household income just to eat. So those are good things, but this crowd will point out a basket of sustainability on environmental issues, economic viability issues, and social justice or equity issues that is a critique of big ag. And so argue, our argument would be we're basically screwed because this group is, we have one system supplying 97 percent of our food. It's, it's, it's kind of like those Irish potatoes. We're pretty dependent on one system. Now you want to be, you know, I don't know what scares you. I know it doesn't scare me. It, when, they, when they proclaim the next storm of the century, which we had I think like five of this year. <laughs> but you know what is scary? If you've ever had the chance, when they, the next storm of the century whips on through, or is supposed to whip on through? Go to your local Myers at about midnight the day before. Uh, anybody been? What do you see there? <laughs> Not a bloody thing. <laughs> so all of those inventory systems, the just-in-time stuff that takes all the cost out, that's great. But you know, in food systems, it might be smart to have some redundancy built into the system because things happen from time to time. So we've got a lot of risk associated there we don't even think about sometimes. The other thing that's sort of fundamental and another dividing point in this country is sort of this global warming, climate change argument. And I would like to just put it to the side and, and say it's unimportant, whether it's man causing it, whether it's happening at all. By the way, it was the fourth warmest January um, in the world this year, which I, I want to look at the data myself, but <laughs> that's what they say. But there's a guy, and I've, it's a mythical character. His name is Al, <laughs> his name is Al Moore, who is a combination of Al Gore and Michael Moore. <laughs> Al Moore was like the Paul Revere of climate change, right? They, he raised the alarm that there was a crisis and half the crowd believes and the other half of the crowd doesn't believe. Well, to me there's a more fundamental issue that affects the same kind of thinking that the last 60 years, not only cheap food, but the lowest energy cost inputs in the history of the world as we blew through all of the inexpensive oil products. Because this is how we used to get oil out of the ground. We basically stick a pipe in the ground and up it came. Now we got to go down 30,000 feet. We got to do this very catastrophic, you know, you can argue whether it's the right or wrong thing to do, but whether it's the Alberta tar sands or fracking, the costs of getting the, la the rest of the oil out is much higher than the oil we've gotten out already. So I would argue that rather than debating whether Al Moore is right or wrong, that we should just kind of celebrate that we're all children of Jed Clampett. <laughs> we all really did grow up in an era where you could stick and get cheap oil, and it's gone now. And so cheap oil changes us as much as not cheap oil is going to change us. We need to get on with a very serious task of reworking an economy that functions without lots of cheap energy. So, and food systems are part of it. You know, everybody talks about transportation and housing. But food systems represent the third largest category of energy uses after transportation and built environment. And it's good to know that on Monday, May 3rd, 2011, when two things were happening in Washington, among many other things, but Congress, for purposes of school lunch program, was debating whether the pizza was a vegetable or not. It's true. Meanwhile, two senior officers from the then Admiral of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, released a new strategic narrative, because if you didn't know it, this country's official strategic narrative is still based on a 1948 essay uh, about the Cold War. We haven't uh, officially changed that, which maybe we smart, we can go back to that now. I don't know. But, uh, but what Colonel Mickleby and C Captain Porter conclude, and I'm sorry you can't read that because of the lighting, is basically anybody who thinks that military strength alone is going to make us a safe country is doing crack. That if we're going to be a safe country, it's going to have to be on the basis of education systems, on diplomacy and international development skills, and on a commitment to sustainable practices in energy and agriculture. 
it's big ticket stuff. And so the local food movement, the regional food movement, is really about using this righteousness to reform all of our food systems, but maybe make a more bifurcated system where it's not all the same style. Because the single biggest thing that should unite us across divisions is we have a handful of companies that own enormous market shares between those fairly modest number of farmers, 450,000, and 300, or actually 450,000 versus 300 million, it's much, we're not 330 million now, so whatever the 2.5% number, 1.5% number is. The point is that there are four or five meat packers. There's a couple of three or four fluid milk processors that stand between all those farmers and all of us consumers. And they wield enormous influence and they wield enormous power. And like our banks, they may be too big to fail, but what if they do? And so you see this play out um, in a lot of different ways. So food access is an issue. Now, in Detroit, there aren't a lot of grocery stores, although in the last year it's gotten a lot better with the addition of Whole Foods and Myers. Um, but I don't like the term food desert because there are plenty of places to buy food in Detroit. They're called convenience stores. And I have good news and I have bad news about them. The good news is that you can get a completely balanced diet at your local convenience store. Certainly, the carbohydrate section tends to dominate. <laughs> but if you look closely, you can see the vegetable stand there represented by the salsa-like <laughs> product. Oops. And if you look a little closer yet, you can see the dairy section represented by the cheese-like product there. <laughs> I didn't point out in my introduction that at the University of Illinois, I also worked for two years at Kraft Foods making squeeze parquet and Miracle Whip. <laughs> a lot of people think the work I do now is an atonement for that time. <laughs> uh, one need only go in the next aisle and get a meat-like product, <laughs> and you can have a completely balanced, although nutrition-free diet. <laughs> now, the relationship between cheap food and high health care costs are not direct, but they are related in some significant fashion. While we lead the world in low food costs, we also lead the world in outstanding medical care and particularly the cost of our outstanding medical care. 19% of gross national product trending towards 22%. The next closest country is the Netherlands, which ironically is the second most dependence on processed food in the world. Uh, they're at 14%. So what we're eating is in large part uh, helping to bank not just kill us, but bankrupt us. Now, when it comes to employment around food, we've taken all those people out of production. In Michigan, we've done a terrible job. Despite this great diversity of production, we haven't captured the value-added part of food. So while we're second-ish to California in terms of crop diversity, 150 crops, we're 22nd in the United States in terms of food processing employment. So we're shipping a lot of food out to be where the value gets added in other places. So if you did a little bit of basic economic modeling, if you could imagine a system that isn't 97% big ag and 3% farmer direct, which is it is now at CSAs and the farmers markets, but actually a system that's maybe more 20% regional scaled agriculture. And by the way, we're being forced to do this by nature because the Central Valley is in all kinds of deep shit right now. And we get a lot of our national fruits and vegetables from there and from Leamington, Ontario. So we're pretty good there. But I digress. If we got to a more of an 80-20 split, what would that look like in terms of just the city population of Detroit on its 2,000 census, which is roughly 900,000 people? You create about 5,000 jobs. You create about $19 million in new household, uh, state and local taxes. And you create about $125 million in new household income. It's the equivalent of adding a major industry to the city. It isn't the solution. I hate urban agriculture as a term because farmer, uh, farmers, mayors, and economic development officials try to imagine why I would want to tear down uh, a perfectly good subdivision or skyscraper to put in corn and bean fields. But when we talk about it, it's really talking about a system, not just food production. It's a regional food system where you grow it, you produce it, you process it, you distribute it, you retail it. There's a couple of new pieces we've got to do because we've got so few people know how to grow anything anymore. We've got to teach people how to be farmers. We've got so many illiterate people in the kitchen, myself included. We've got to teach people how to eat again. So the education part is huge. And then we also have this waste problem where we burn or bury stuff that we need to really begin to think about how we can use that to enrich our soils like we did until this 60 area cheap energy time came in and we could make fertilizers from oil. That's the system. And our goal at the market is to be a leader in the region to try to build those partnerships. We focus on the processing. We focus on the distribution. We focus on the retailing side of it and work with partners to make sure that all of the pieces of a 
food puzzle are being looked at and how we can strengthen the regional components of that. It is a five or six county area we ought to be thinking about, not just the city of Detroit. This is 30 years ago, we didn't know much about downtown development when I was started in that world. I like to stay a little bit ahead of what common knowledge, that way they can't track you very well. But 30 years ago, also, we didn't know much about watersheds and about how we could care better for our rivers and lakes. Well, thinking about food as a regional food shed is today what we, we now have a body of knowledge about how to improve our regional watersheds, and we're developing one about how to increase our regional food sheds. So, currently our growers come from a wide variety of places all throughout the state of Michigan. Christmas tree from the UP at certain times of year. At our wholesale market, we have a tomato grower that comes from just uh, near New Buffalo, Indiana, actually in Michigan. Um, drives five hour, four hours each way, five semis, six, five days a week for about four months. Three, great family operation. Sister is the grower. One brother takes a fleet of trucks to the Chicago market. One bra brother brings a fleet of trucks to the Detroit market. Very successful tomato growers. Uh, in the city, again, a lot of attention to urban agriculture. And while it isn't the solution for open space in Detroit, it's a, it's a good solution for three very un reasons that you may not think about. One is neighbors working with neighbors to affect positive change without relying on anybody else. So 2004, 40, 80, formal participants in something called the Garden Resource Collaborative. This year expected over 1,500 participants. Some are postage stamps, some are a couple of acres, wide variety of sizes. One program, 20 to $30, depending on the size, gives you access to training classes, gives you access to seeds and plants, to transplants, gives you access to free soil testing, and if you're large enough and you have excess produ product, you can participate in their seller's co-op, which sells at our market and a half a dozen other places in the city. The uh, Grown in Detroit stand, one of our favorites, all organic. They do very well. And uh, from that portfolio of 70-ish growers, we've already launched three independent growers are now off on their own. They have their own stands at Eastern Market. So it's a drip, 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 drip. The third thing it does, besides, so some economic development activity emerging, not enough to address seriously some of the huge unemployment issues in Detroit, but neighbors working with neighbors to get the neighborhood better, and no better way to get people educated about food than actually to, that taking that carrot out of the ground and washing it off and stick it in your mouth and figuring out that might be normal and that the Twinkie might be weird <laughs> rather than the other way around. So into the market area, there's a facility called the Detroit Market Garden, which is a two and a half acre model market garden to work with community gardeners to show how on that scale of production you could create a job, job and a half, two jobs year-round production, what you grow, crop rotation, um, again, how do we keep that steady flow, expand the market. Now, we're also working, at, this story came out last week, a little bit premature, but Detroit Public Schools has a lot of uh, food supplies they need to buy, $16 million a year, and uh, they've got a lot of former buildings they don't need anymore. So the opportunity around Kettering, former Kettering High School is to create a 27-acre food production and processing center as a workforce development site with support from Michigan State University on the technical farming side, with support from us to help them find new markets for products so if they don't have a demand in the classroom and they, they can, they don't, the food doesn't rot, it gets used. So that's something that's, that's going to happen. Now there's a lot of interest in indoor agriculture and uh, uh, aquaponics. Um, and this picture here is actually from the front of Fortune magazine, uh, the John Hans Project, when it was originally announced being the largest urban farm in the world. A lot of hoopla around technology embracing vertical systems. Now, I'm 60-ish. This was at the cusp of my youth. I remember it a bit. But this stuff reminds me of the underwater cities of tomorrow <laughs> that were popular in the 1950s. We haven't really figured out very well, whether it's big ag or small ag, how to make money on a per acre basis. I'm not sure we're going to make money on a per square foot basis when you factor in new construction. Now, having said that, there are some pretty interesting breakthroughs, but rather than as a means to decorate fancy skyscrapers, using indoor systems that don't require sunlight, 
which are still not economically viable, getting better, closer, might be a way to repurpose all of these vacant commercial industrial buildings that we haven't figured out what the heck to do with. And they're not just in Detroit. You know, Troy, Michigan, home of Kmart. There's at least three generations of Kmart buildings around the greater Detroit area. You know, and not all of them can be big lots, you know. So there's a lot of, there, you know, we have more, not only do we have the highest health care costs, we also have the most square footage of retail in the history of the world <laughs> at 27 square feet per person. It's gone down a little bit since 2008, but it's probably going to go down a little bit more, especially since online sales are proliferating. So a lot of vacant commercial space, not just in d desolate places like Detroit, but near where people live, which if we can get the economics right about replacing the sun with artificial light, it could work. We're not quite there yet. So Michigan State is kind of a leader, and we could actually be at the cutting edge of that. But there's a lot of places that are jockeying for that position. Now at the market itself, so we work with a lot of partners on the production side, new technology, old technology. Let's grow more stuff locally. Let's figure out economically viable ways to do that. That's not what we do. Our job is to provide cheap form of entry into the market and connect those new growers along with our existing growers to buyers who want to access local foods. You folks at Saturday Market, restaurants that are increasingly are trying to get more local food onto their menu, hospitals and schools that are under state mandates to increase local uh, content in their budgets. All of those are new customers to our wholesale market. But the, re the facility was uh, in need of upgrades, so starting in 2008, Shed two, shed three in 2010. That represented about total about eight million dollars invested. Uh, in two 2012, we began, and this year we will actually complete an eight and a half million dollar project of shed five. It's uh, uh, you know as much as we spent on the two previous sheds. It has a number of uses. It's the home of our plant and flower growers. It is actually the site of most pivotal project we're talking about, and that is the creation of a shared use community kitchen to allow us to do two things we do now better and more of. One is incubate new food making businesses. And number two is provide a place to teach people about food, particularly on market days when there's 30 or 40,000 people that walk by this space. And then we also will have a, a lovely outdoor area where you can actually, for the first time in 122 years of Saturday market, be actually able to sit down in a nice place and enjoy the day. So we've gotten by we're without any really nice seating area, and we're regarded by MIT as one of the top 15 places in North America without having any place to sit. I think that's quite, of a, <laughs> quite an achievement. Uh, the shared use community kitchen is important to us. It was so important that we didn't wait to have one to start building a network of shared use kitchens. So when we took over the market in 2006, the city previously had only allowed the sale of fresh fruits and vegetables, plants, and flowers. Early on, we began to accept applications for people making pastas and pierogies and jams, jellies, sausages. And now we have an inventory of about 125 companies who would like to be selling at the market. We can accommodate, in a year's time, about 80 of those at any one Saturday in peak season, maybe 50. But we've got another 75 people who haven't even figured out where to make what a product they have in their heart or mind. And so with a group called Food Lab Detroit, which is an advocacy group of those people who have an aspiration to make a food product, we created a program jointly called Detroit Kitchen Connect, which actually goes out, researches, finds underutilized kitchens in Detroit's neighborhoods, gets them permitted if they're not permitted, fills in the blanks, what equipment needs are there, and connects them via a web-based platform to people who want to rent them for $15 to $18 an hour. We don't need to have a kitchen begin to do what we're going to do. We actually want to end up with a citywide network of these connected places. And what we found is it isn't the availability of kitchens that hold people back. It's the availability of people to hold people's hands and take them through the labyrinth of getting permitting and licensing and all those tasks. And mostly college-educated people will be able to figure out and kind of persevere because they're not trying to raise two kids at the same time. But those 12 Hispanic moms that have two other jobs and a couple of kids to raise don't really have that luxury. And so providing those services to those neighborhood-based people is really, really important to spreading some of the entrepreneurial success in Detroit. We have 11 people. We have two kitchens up and running, 11 folks that are beginning to make food products and trying to get them to market. Uh, you know, we've had some So there's three, excuse me, four critical things to grow a new business. One is low-cost access to market. 
Well, that's what we've been doing since 1891. You know, I only started talking about this in the last six months because we took it so much for granted that for $80 you can rent a stall at Easter Market <coughs> and you can have your product exposed to 30 or 40,000 people. McClure's Pickles started out selling at the market. They're in 29 states now. The history of the market in terms of people whose entrepreneurial life began because of forced servitude by their parents or grandparents at the market is phenomenal. There's a guy, um, Sheldon Yellen, I, I'm trying to, he's a prop, Belcor. Uh, it's the largest property restoration firm in the world. Uh, they restored a library in one of the stands in Central Asia after a, a typhoon tore it apart. This saved a ancient manuscripts. Um, 60,000 employees. Uh, he started his business career working for his aunt, making 18 cents an hour selling apples at Eastern Market. So he's going to come back this season, and we're going to pay him $1.12 an hour, <laughs> which is the cost of living adjusted 18 cents an hour from, from 1960. <laughs> and he's going to do it as a fundraiser for some of the youth entrepreneurship programs that we've developed to, to find the next batch of Sheldon Yellens. So, but, so you need this low cost access to market. You need expertise, and it can come from MSU, which we, has blessed us with a couple of staff people that they've assigned to work with food entrepreneurs at the market. It can come from each other. And so the market's open in the summer from 5 a.m. to 6, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. roughly. So you're standing there for 12 hours next to someone who's also trying to make a living. And the shared mentoring, the peer mentoring, has been hugely transformational to many of our companies. So we had a Love's Custard Pie. Uh, if you get a chance, get down to the market. They have great product. Um, they had put their retirement savings in a frozen custard stand on Detroit's west side and concluded within about six weeks that there wasn't a future in the frozen custard business in their neighborhood on the west side. And so they had a kitchen, and they had grandma's custard pie recipes from the deep south. And so they started using the commercial kitchen at the, at the custard stand to begin making pies. Good quality product, crappy presentation in terms of the booth, inferior product packaging. Meanwhile, across the way, the guy who worked for McClure's on weekends was an unemployed auto show exhibit builder and started looking around at all the crappy displays and said, oh, I have some skill sets here that might work, and developed a low-cost system that applies. You can re-engineer your Costco Sam's Club folding tables, which is the du jour, which is the default model of how people set up at the market, they, the ones that fold in half. You know, everybody's got a couple in their garage, right? So it's PVC, screws on, lightweight, nice vinyl banner. All comes apart, fits in the back of the truck, trunk or truck, and it looks good. He also took a little bit of, actually did the first prototype for Love's Custard Pie in exchange for custard pies. <laughs> and didn't become a diabetic. As a result. <laughs> he also redesigned their logo so that a year goes by, they're making more pies, it's looking good, a cable TV superstar comes by and says on national cable TV, this may be the best pie, this may be the best custard, no, this may be the best pie I've ever had in my whole life. And all of a sudden, they're shipping pies on dry ice to Manhattan. Sales double. The family is not entirely whole, but they're getting better. These stories proliferate around the market. Uh, quarter sausage, great fresh sausage product. Had, they made 400 pounds of sausage for three years, four years. After the first year, they tried to expand. It took them three years to, to get into their own kitchen. They had a $125,000 equipment finance problem that we couldn't help them address. Finally, this is how mentoring helps. Finally, two pizza restaurant owners got so tired of him selling out at retail every week, not being able to buy his product at wholesale to put on their pies, each wrote out checks for $50,000 to buy the damn equipment so he could expand, so they could buy his sausage to put on their pizzas. Again, that mentoring is great. So access to market, access to expertise, access to capital, and then low-cost production space. So we're trying to weave that web, make all four of those available. We use the kitchen for inspiring youth to get involved in food businesses. And uh, this is our partnership with Food Lab. We also have uh, a re-granting program. Charter One Foundation was very generous with us. We gave 30 grants this year to farmers or food makers or businesses in the Eastern Market District. 
one to three thousand dollars. What's that one piece of equipment you need to, to be able to double your sales of X? And we're we're very happy with that program so far. That's our sausage guy, and that's our pickle guys. So to accelerate, so pierogies, for example, is a great case study because we had someone that made really excellent pierogies. It was their grandmother's recipe. They were like the pickle guy. They didn't have any interest in food, but they're really good marketeers. So they came up with a great design, great booth, great execution, great presentation. They took their grandmother's recipe from Ham Tramick and gave it smartly to another grandma from Ham Tramick, and she was making 400 pierogies a week, and everybody was happy. So happy that the representative from Plum Market and Whole Foods came in and said, we want to buy collectively 4,000 pierogies a week. Whoa! How do we do that? Well, there's two ways. Like the sausage guy, you can build your own facility, but that takes time and money, and these guys are long gone by then. So the short-term way to do it is to work with a third party who's making tons of uh, uh, meat pies. I don't know. I'm trying to think of some comparable product. Take a recipe. Except they couldn't find that. So they found a well-meaning not-for-profit group that wanted to do workforce development. And they said, we can do that. And together, neither one of them could understand that when you go from selling it direct to a fresh product that's almost consumed at once, you've got to have a product that can sit on a shelf for a couple of three, four days, maybe three, four weeks. And so to taste the same as the fresh product, you basically have to start over and redo the whole recipe to get to the same tasting thing that has shelf life. It's very complicated. So they failed. They went back and now they're doing their, four, they've got another grandma and they're, they're doing their 400 and they're making money and they're trying to figure out how. So to help that crowd expand from the end of batch production into the beginning of small scale industrial production, we partnered with somebody who's done it in half a, dozen, half a dozen different products already, and that's Garden Fresh Gourmet. And so we recently got some funding from the State Department of Ag for them to move from doing it informally with people like uh, Randy's Granola and Drought, which they've already helped, but to formally provide that service, that engineering support, the third party liability issues. Actually, now they've got a pipeline of products that they're able to put on their truck and get into grocery stores around the country. So they're our partner in doing two things. One is providing this technical assistance that isn't place-based. That can happen anywhere. And the second is in a vacant and abandoned building in the market district, which we have a couple of large tenants that are going to fill it with some very exciting cutting-edge food technologies. But to create a suite of 15,000 square feet where you have one to 3,000 square foot spaces that are basically a, a blank room with a hood and some plug it, some heavy duty electric that companies like the sausage guy can move into in six or eight months rather than 24, 30, or 36 months. So both of those strategies are important because our job is to maintain this. It isn't really a pipeline. It's more like a, more like a funnel because there's a lot of people at the beginning that just want to augment some income or have a part-time hobby and there's nothing wrong with that. We're interested though in those that can scale up because we need the jobs. We think that's where the job rich part is. So uh, we do it. We also work regionally with Wayne, Oakland, Macomb counties, the State Department of Ag, State Economic Development, people, something called the Trade Food and Ag Network, which is working with larger companies like Garden Fresh, like Ant Mids, uh, like uh, Better Made Chips, trying to plug them into local supplies so that we can keep more of that money locally, trying to find out what we can do to help them grow quicker, faster, better, sooner to create more jobs. Uh, at the market, our, one of our next projects is also, this is our last major shed for renovation. It connects our two big indoor sheds, and we want to rebuild it with 48 units of workforce housing above it. We want to do that for two reasons. One is to benefit ourselves and create a successful housing product above the market, which can help subsidize our operations in long term, increase our safety by having more people with eyes to the street, particularly during odd hours of the day and night. And we want to do it for all of those other farmers markets in the United States that are now getting so successful that they're starting to think about replacing their temporary farmers market in the parking lot with their first market hall. Are you familiar with the market hall in Grand Rapids? It's fabulous. $30 million project. Unfortunately, the Grand Rapids situation doesn't exist in most places. So with this approach, if 80% of the square footage is housing related, we can use 80% of the cost of the building can be put onto the housing related part of the project 
thereby reducing the amount we have to raise just for the market part. And if we create a successful housing product, you create cash flow that can subsidize the housing part over time. Because most market structures do not either pay for themselves or they don't generate enough revenue to not have to have some sort of, it can be modest subsidy, but a subsidy nonetheless. We're challenged by the market district in the 1960s. Federal Highway Administration put a six-lane freeway between our produce department and our meat department. <laughs> so you go over this little bridge, and if, have, how many have made this journey? Uh, that's pretty good. I'd say about 40%. And across the other side, you find uh, a private market hall with two aisles. Well, aisle one is 250 feet long. The locals call it 500 feet of meat. <laughs> it's a great butcher shop, great collection of butcher shops, actually six of them. Collectively, they do between 20 and $30 million a year of meat sales per year. And it's about 75 to 90% uh, food stamp uh, currency. So um, people in the city not eating enough fruit, vet, fruit and vegetables are not having a problem finding meat. But if you go on the other side, if you go into this market, you will see not an inspiring fruit and vegetable collection like you might see at the markets in Barcelona. You would, in fact, see a selection that you would find at most corner stores in Detroit. So while there's plenty of meat, there's also plenty of six-week-old onions and potatoes to choose from as well. And so our goal is to go into the other side and create a 2,000-square-foot palace of fruits and vegetables and use our voucher programs where in, in Michigan growing season, you actually, when people redeem their food stamps because of the <coughs> Double Up Food Buck program, People who redeem $20 worth of food stamps actually get a voucher that they can get $20 worth of Michigan-grown fruits and vegetables at no additional cost. Uh, and it's funded by foundations. It actually was so successful in changing people's dietary patterns that the, they put a $100 million pilot in the farm bill to try to experiment with that approach. And so people can actually buy their meat and get their vegetables for free. But we've got to apply the concept of marketing because, you know, while we say the vulnerable... Low-income people consume one-seventh the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables that people, the bottom 20%, one-seventh the amount that the top 20% do. <coughs> the top 20% are only, you know, the federal government says, USDA says we should get half of our daily calories from fruits and vegetables. Top 20% fall short by about 50% of that goal. So it isn't that anybody's eaten the diet that people recommend if we want to live long. None of us are. So... We're focused on nutrition, but we're delivering it through a message of being delicious, not being nutritious. Nobody buys nutritious. You buy presentation, you buy taste, you buy convenience, you buy delicious. So across the country, all sorts of markets are experiencing rebirth or new construction. That's the West Side market. That's the Grand Rapids market. And we actually had a plan like Grand Rapids to build a sexy food palace. But you already got Nino Savaggio's and Joe's Pro's. There's a fine line between sort of uh, what sexy food palaces are versus a, a, a nice market hall. And we still maybe want to build one of those one day. But all of those projects that I talked about are about building food businesses, which is more important for us right now than having you come down on Tuesday to have a really cool experience at this really cool market. We want you to come down on Tuesday and enjoy the seasonal market, come down on Saturday and enjoy the transient market. But our focus is on creating those food jobs, and addressing food access throughout the city of Detroit. Because no matter how much money we spend building this great market to build food businesses, um, this is, let me skip to the food access part. The neighborhood stuff is, I, I do have to talk just a couple of points about neighborhood stuff before I get into food access. Uh, this gentrification issue is huge. You know, we're still here because we weren't gentrified into bars and boutiques and lofts. And I thought we were well protected by blight from ever having to worry about an invasion of artsy, crafty, cool, clever people. This is the worst block I've ever had to administer as a downtown development guy in 30 years. We spent $10,000 to remove graffiti on two different occasions to see it come back worse than it was two weeks later. And I'd given up. And while, when I gave up, uh, it was at the same exact time that a representative of the Red Bull Company was signing a, a five-year lease to create the third in the world visual art salon after Lisbon and um, San Paulo, uh, Brazil. And so they, op they opened this fabulous space in the sub-basement. It had been a storehouse for the e &B Brewery. It's actually two basement levels down. It's exceptionally cool. It has four openings a year. They attract three to 4,000 people. 
uh, area artists come together for six weeks and create a show that they then put up. So it's, it's, we have all, you know, impromptu fashion shows on a Thursday night in September. Um, so we have a little bit of creeping gentrification we have to manage now. Um, we have had investment. Um, the Hurt family, the DeVries family, um, had a little bit of a falling out and putting back together of their retail and wholesale divisions. Ended up with a better store than we had before. Uh, and it's great to see that progress. It's great to see the new Germax. But at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that we preserve this place as a safe place for low-cost, dirty, and loud food businesses in the core. And at the same time, trying to achieve more real estate development for the city of Detroit by pushing some of the clever stuff north and east and south. So the Gratiot Corridor or the DeQuinter Cut Corridor that we're pretty excited about because this money shot, that, that's where I looked down when we came up here for the weekend getaway. And uh, last November we began working on it. And by next November it'll look something like that. Um, it is one of the coolest emerging spaces in Detroit. If you have any of you been to the first phase of the DeQuinter Cut? This phase is much different because the first phase has, serv has service roads on either side. In this phase, the buildings come right up to the cut. And so you'll have the ability to create some very distinctive live-work kind of spaces. And I'm not sure how much retail, but uh, a lot of interesting spaces can be created along this very unusual place. So that can be transformative. That can set off this, unleash this power of gentrification we have to be worried about. But if you go east from here, that's where the great unbuilt Detroit begins. There's acres and acres and acres of dirt that we've got to figure out more value there. So this is our strategy to preserve the core as a food place and while we push mixed use to the east and push mixed use to the south. But whatever we do at the market, there's a lot of places in Detroit where this is the default availability of fresh fruits and vegetables. We've tried to address that. Uh, and about, i got about five more minutes, and I'd like to take some questions. Um, we have 19 sites that we pop up and sell fresh fruits and vegetables at neighborhood sites and at corporate and healthcare sites. That's been our sustainability model. The corporate and healthcare sites, people are doing that as a wellness program for their employees. So Henry Ford Health Systems, um, Illich Holdings, um, Gilbert Enterprises, they sponsor a farm stand location. It helps us pay the labor costs for the college kids we hire to, to man them, staff them. And uh, it gives us enough income to actually provide that service for free in neighborhood sites where there is no good selection of fruits and vegetables. We also work with 14 partners to create a citywide network of neighborhood farmers markets. So now we have this distributed 1,500 community gardeners. We've got 14 community markets, and now we're building these community kitchens to be able to conduct production to processing to retailing in a neighborhood basis. Not sure where that leads, if anywhere, but to have those three things working organically from the bottom up, as we think is important as working with Garden Fresh and the big guys from the top down. So, uh, third or fourth year doing this, again, the alternative. What we found is when you say we, people aren't don't have ready access to fruits and vegetables, there's a food access problem. That implies that if we just fix the supply, people would eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. Why should they? Why, should, why are we? We've all gotten pretty used to the convenience of not eating fresh fruits and vegetables. And so there are two ways to address long-term demand for more fruits and vegetables. One is through incentives. Um, and this is pretty fascinating. So this is a combined food stamp and double up food bucks. We go through about $700,000 a year between the two, 750. But since 2012, they've been flat. What we think that's telling us is two things. The economy has gotten a little better. It was growing geometrically. The economy is doing a little better. And we've reached all the people who are normally inclined to want to eat more fruits and vegetables from low income perspective. And now we have the much larger task of changing habit. And so that's where our work with Detroit Public Schools and school food is so important to begin changing a conversation at the household level. So we work with Detroit Public Schools to help them on a school garden program. Um, this is the Garden Resource Collaborative. It's, it's seniors, it's kids that learning about food is important. The Lions have joined up. 
They have become a sponsor of our work with Detroit Public Schools and around food access in general. So in Detroit Public Schools, two, two primary objectives we're after. One is to get a school garden that's formal and organized and not dependent on the passion of a particular teacher or principal or the check of a corporation that can disappear. They often show up together for one year at a time and then disappear. Detroit Public Schools Office of School Nutrition is a money generating machine, mostly because they have backed off a lot. They don't have cooks anymore in their kitchen, so food has to be, this food has to be re-engineered, healthier food has to be re-engineered to get there in more ready to use formats because they can't afford to pay cooks. <coughs> so we work with them on the supply side, we work with them on the garden side so that when good food gets into the school tray, the kids know to enjoy it and embrace it, not to run from it. So it's long-term work. The Lions kind of show up uh, during the season. They bring their players from the school garden programs. We bring kids to the Tuesday market. The players have lunch with them, extol the virtues of healthy eating and steroids to the importance of, the, I mean, <laughs> of healthy eating to their careers. And then they go shop the market together uh, and they talk about food. It's, again, this isn't a lecture. This, this is a raising of consciousness and moving food from the back of our collective brains that has, where it's been for 60 years just to be more um, conscious and deliberate about what we eat and how we eat it. So I talk about our and we, and it's not just Eastern Market. It's a, it's a rich collection of partnerships from the Fair Food Network to the school system to Greeners Community Food Bank to a whole host of Forgotten Harvest. There is a lot of great nonprofit collaboration going on in the food space in Detroit. It's happening throughout the state. Governor Snyder gets it, put the first new money in the State Department of Ag budget in 13 years to help build out a statewide network of, of regional food hubs. <coughs> so we meet quarterly, led by Michigan State and the Department of Ag. There's groups working like ours in about 13 different Michigan communities trying to figure out how to keep more money in Michigan, how to get more jobs, how we can not have empty trucks between Traverse City and Detroit, but they're full both ways. And so to conclude, the biggest hurdle still sometimes is the corporate sector, big business, doesn't really see how you people can ever be financially relevant. The 97% may have, you know, it's just, it, 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 it sounds nice, but how does it, how does it pencil out, Dan? <laughs> well, so they think it's kind of a return to some medieval format. People of color in Detroit think local food is like a return to sharecropping or slavery. Uh, white elected leaders and economic development guys think it's going even further back than that. But it's already happening in our economy. We're moving from a period of mass commodification to an era of mass, mass specialization. It's happening with news, daily newspapers. It's happening in one of my favorite, the world of beer, where this is actually very old data. But the incremental growth of craft beer continues unabated since 2008, so last year there. It's today in excess of 10% of market share. It began with 0% market share in 1985 when I owned four places called brewing companies with the last name with a fill in the blank first name depending on what town they were in. The first brew pub opened up in 1985 in Toronto. We studied a lot because we cared about our beer. We carried a huge selection of imports and all sorts of exotic beers that in the third tier towns we were operating in that nobody had ever thought of before. And I concluded in 1985 that this craft beer, this beer brew pub movement was a fad, not a trend. And I've never been so happy to be so wrong about something in my life. And today you see it, not just craft beers in, in Michigan, a huge explosion of craft, the wine industry, the craft spirits. We have, we have you know, in 1975 and six, when I was in Manchester, England, learning how to drink beer, um, if you had told me in 1976, the people from Scotland and Ireland would come to the United States to drink our whiskeys, that people from Germany and England would come to the United States to drink our beer, and that people from France would come here to drink our wine, I would have thought you were a little bit off your game. If that had all happened during the time when the country seemed to go from being somewhat odd to being really weird, it's even odder yet. But we got, we got the drinking thing, we're working on that well. 
it's already happening in food. The meteoric growth of farmers' markets, the interest in local food, is a, it, it's already a trend in food. And it, we need to accelerate it so that we can get to that 20% market share in about the same time, 30 years, that beer got to half of that, about 10%. We can't afford, food is too important to the national discussion on health care and health care containment costs to let it take that long to get as beer has been. We need to really accelerate the interest. And the way to do it is to change the narrative, I believe, not so much worry about the policy. I don't really want to live in a world that outlaws Happy Meals, but I would love to live in a world that Happy Meals went away because nobody bought them anymore. So it's up to us and how we engage with food systems. So the market's there. It's a resource. We try to bring people together around this issue and uh, be happy to uh, try to tackle a few questions for a few minutes. I am legally deaf, so I'll come to you so you can speak loudly and I can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Um, we bike down in Detroit a few times a year, and we end up at Eastern Market to eat lunch. There's nowhere to park our bikes. Nowhere to park a bus? A bike. A bike. <laughs> or, or a bus, for that matter. Um, well, there's good news. <laughs> so I, I glanced over it really quickly because I had gone on too far about some of the other stuff. But as part of the DeQuinter Kite trail system, it's actually, there's two trail systems that are being, phase four of the Midtown Loop will, be com will complete into phase two of the DeQuinter Cut. And there'll actually be a, a third piece on the street, not a trailway, but a bike marking will connect to the Hamtramck Trail. So Detroit, for its first time, will have actually not some bike path parts, but actually the beginnings of a system where you'll be able to go from downtown along the riverfront up to the Quinter Cut through Eastern Market over to Midtown, Wayne State <coughs> Universities, or up to Hamtramck. But e the even better news is throughout this network, there is funding for two major bike parking facilities in the Eastern Market District, one near our office and one across the street from Russell Street Deli. And... And if that's not enough, we're working with Shinola, who has <laughs> developed its own um, bike parking, um, sort of low cost, fairly attractive uh, bike stand that it wants to make available to merchants in Midtown and Eastern Market and Downtown to put in front of their stores. So all that, by the end of the summer, we should be in pretty good shape. Yes, sir. Kind of a two part question, number one, how, how do you interface with the Canadian uh, produce growers that, that come over, on the, particularly on the weekends in the, in the late fall and summer? And uh, the other, how do you interface with the established uh, businesses that are already there at the Eastern Market, you know, that and so forth? And the question was, how do we interface with Canadian growers? And how do we interface with existing businesses? Um, the Canadian growers has been a bit of a challenge for us. Um, we've, we've lost participation. Uh, Two parts, a little bit because of the cross-border issues related to 9-11, but mostly the parity of the Canadian and the U.S. dollar. So their financial incentive to come over is, is less than it once was. It used to be very compelling when the Canadian dollar was 80 or 90 cents. There was a strong benefit to come. Now, we've kept a, a pretty strong core because we're still 4 million people closer to them than their next 4 million people are, which is in, in Toronto. Um, the big hydroponic growers in Leamington, we get some of the smaller players that come year-round to the market. Um, most of the big, the, the Mastrodani's, uh, they're selling into the big grocery chains, Kroger's, Myers, um, Hy-Vee in the Midwest. <coughs> Interestingly, the, the, the reason, the number one reason, there, there are two primary reasons why Leamington, Ontario exists. If it, has anyone been to, Leamington is like the largest collection of indoor production in North America. It's there for two primary reasons. If you ask them, the Italian families who live there will say it's their fault, or, or they're, they're the reason. But it's somewhat tied to that the Ontario provincial government saw food access and food supply as an important security issue many years ago, and they granted them a long-term discounted heavy Ontario crude oil contract to, to provide the, the energy solution to indoor production. The interesting thing is many of those growers are, have become um, Michigan-based. There's a lot of Michigan corporate participation in Leamington. And the, the provincial government in Ontario is ending those long-term energy contracts. So those producers are now beginning to look at locations in the states to make sure that they're not 
uh, caught in a cost uncompetitive situation. Mastrodani's, one of the Mastrodani families has opened a major production facility in Coldwater uh, in Michigan. There are two major issues about why we're not seeing more of that. One is the cost of energy. Coldwater has a locally owned utility that was willing to discount its rates more than DTE or citizens. And that's, um, consumers. Consumers. consumers, I'm sorry. Um, and B, this is interesting, going through the General Assembly right now, uh, legislature, I'm sorry, uh, my Illinois roots show. Um, it's, it's such an investment in equipment that they treat it as an industrial investment, not an agricultural production. So the real estate taxes um, will either will be adjusted or we won't see any more production facilities like in, in Michigan. So um, the Canadians are great resources. We probably have a half a dozen of our largest wholesale growers are, are Canadians. And uh, we haven't grown the market, but we've been able to hold on to those we had. In terms of who's in the market, <coughs> the businesses are on the market. Um, as a 10-year veteran, as a merchant, merchants are uh, a prickly bunch. And um, we have some that go back to before the market was there. We have, it's a wonderful, rich mix that we, we've had some bloody um, arguments the last couple of weeks. We've worked through them. Um, it's great. It's actually one of the, it's one of the most interesting. It, it certainly de de deserves its own rea reality show on TV. <laughs> um, um, there are characters galore. I know we, we yeah. uh, and it's it's just the, the range of businesses in the mix is pretty fascinating. We have Wolverine, is a 1.4 billion dollar company, um, <laughs> third generation. It isn't the sales or the third generation, closely held. The most amazing thing isn't that the, 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 grand, the founder is, that generation is gone, it's the dad and the son. And it isn't that the dad is a great guy um, and knows nearly everybody in the 500 or 600 employees by first name and is the most unpretentious, nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. The most amazing thing is that his son's the same way. <laughs> and that transition from second to third generation is often dicey at best. Mm -hmm. It's happened there. The Grobel family is in the fifth generation, same thing. Now, one thing I didn't talk about is we've been able to marshal our asset uh, to appeal to a concession operator that last Thursday received uh, approval from the Wayne County Airport Administration, uh, whatever authority. So the low number gate Delta Terminal, the food court at the West End, I believe, will be repositioned as an Eastern Market food court and will feature some of those proud family names. The Grovos will be the deli and quarter sausage will have a sausage stand and the, the, the imagery from the market will be featured and we'll have a place to people can take Eastern Market product with them for gifts when, when they go. So it, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. Um, I, I, merchants are merchants. So we've had a we're doing the streetscape project. Somebody woke up last week and realized they were losing three parking spaces in their block and you would have thought that the Russians had invaded <coughs> Eastern market, not the Ukraine. <laughs> and today I was happy to report back to him that we figured out a strategy where we can, it was, I think the original number was 15 down to six, we're back to 10. So I, I think we've reached, we've reached a, a new grand, what was that when the Pope gave <laughs> Portugal, Spain and, or the other way around, <laughs> gave, yeah, no, gave Brazil to Portugal and the rest of South America to Spain, we're kind of at that moment. <laughs> yes, sir. California's, California's food production is not sustainable? Um, California's food production is a really interesting question. You've got the drought. You've got decades now of irrigation and the salinity factor. And you've got certain parts of California where the clay underlining traps all the salts, rendering the land pretty sterile. I was just reading pretty interesting. So remediating that takes, you know, it took decades to create the situation and undoing it's going to take decades as well. We're still very reliant on large producers in the Central Valley for about a seventh of all the fruits and vegetables in this country. Uh, and it's, more, it's actually more like, it's higher than that. It's like 40%, I think. Uh, but that, again, it's, Central Valley is a big place. There are parts that are going to be just fine. But the drought is really, a lot of Central Valley growers are having to choose between row crops you, 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 your irrigation gets cut, you have to choose between the olive trees and the, and the almond trees or the row crops, which one are you going to cut? 
you're going to try to keep the trees growing because if you, if you lose those, it's going to take you five or six years to, to get back to production. So a lot of row crop has already left. And the, the regional production, one of the challenges with national, it, it, row crop production is hard work. And so when corn and bean prices are high, we've continued to lose our middle size. We've got all these young, you know, we found two things that are worse than the hard work of farming in the last 10 years. No work and meaningless work. And so a lot of the college kids that are drawn to growing stuff are there because they really believe it's important. And a lot of the people in the city are because they have nothing else to do. And they, it is hard work. And if they're going to be successful, they're going to either have to make peace with that or they're going to use that as a transition to learn enough skills to do something else. So for the first time in a long time, there are more people who call themselves farmers in the 2010 census than there were in the 2000 census. But we've got thousands of new baby farmers and we're continuing to lose medium and large farmers because of retirement and death and, and, and bad market conditions. So the great news is we took people out of farming because it's hard work. The bad news is that one and a half, that 450,000 people, somewhere around 60% of them are past retirement age. And there's always that farmer in the room will raise his hand as, farmers never retire, son. <laughs> and that's true. But 30% of the 450 are like over 70 years old. So sometimes they don't retire, but they do eventually pass on to an easier lifestyle <laughs> in other ways. Over here. When are Sundays going to start? Sundays are going to start in June. I'd give us uh, till July to kind of work it out if I were here, but no, it'll, <laughs> it'll be fine. It, it's a work in progress. I'll tell you, very, you know. Yes, ma'am. Can I just put in a plug for the Farmer's Cafe? Best place. You bet. You may. We can, Farmer's Cafe has the best breakfast sausage in the world, made in the Eastern Market District. So, any other uh, shout-outs? <laughs> yes. Oh, Bert's. You know Bert's, of course. Bert's Barbecue. It's what? Bird's Barbecue. Bird's Barbecue. The, just the smell alone will <laughs> be enough to feed you. Yeah, you climb out of your car driving down there. <laughs> now, Bert's is fun. Bert's is one of those neighborhood. Uh, um, so Bert's adds this huge um, charm. It's a very European, you know, the karaoke is it's good. It's good. <laughs> um, the problem... So Bert became a bit of a regulatory issue because he has this, takes up all the space in front of his street. We actually tried to advocate with our merchants, and we will when we get all the street work done this year. By next year, it'll all be worked out. And part of our design is to have a different surface in the parking area from the travel lane so that nobody can d dispute how far out you can set your tables or fence because Bert would continue to encroach on the line so that his customers were standing in the travel lane. And, that, and, and we could not object too much when public works and police and folks said that might be a little unsafe condition. So we, we, we want our merchants to use the street in front of their business if they so choose. But we do, that part of the design is to try to make sure it, it still lets traffic uh, by. I have no solutions long term to parking on Saturdays, particularly in the busy months. And that's a problem I hope we never solve because if we do, it'll mean that uh, there aren't, and aren't, there's just no way to put 40,000 people in the market district and have great parking for everybody. So bear with us on that one. So How about getting from the city permission to do head on parking along that one strip that goes along? Was it Gratiot? And Gratiot? Yeah, near Rocky. Yeah, I would love to see that. You know, Gratiot has. The problem with Gratiot is uh, inbound between 8.30 and, or 7.30 and 9 o'clock. The side street above the what? Gratiot. The, the, the side street. Off of? Street. Yeah, where uh, Rockies is. Yeah. There's a side street. I'm just saying. We're talking about the same street. Of weeds there. We could talk into a but the new street <laughs> pattern will put angle parking back on it. Okay. But it'll only be on one side. So there'll be a bit more parking. We also want to take control of the parking deck in the district, which is not often utilized. And other than its location, its lighting, its fencing, its um, management, other than, that, other than its location, it's perfect. Um, uh, and, but we do have ideas about how to 
that's 330 spaces that we should be taking better advantage of. And one of the objectives of making the pedestrian experiences better is to make it a little less painful to walk between places, which the sidewalk condition is, is pretty rough, and uh, particularly if people with mobility issues. So this, would be, this won't be the whole tamale, but we'll be taking a nice bite out of the apple and getting it done. And we'll work on parking. We, got, we found places to add about 200 spaces over time uh, as we restripe streets and do stuff. So. But it won't, it won't solve it. It'll, it'll put a little bomb over it. Yes, ma'am. To go back to uh, Bert's barbecue, is there going to be any outdoor seating at all this year? Because there was not. Um, late in the year when we get the Shed 5 thing done, Bert's is outside, just right. a smaller configuration. No, he said he has more than that, and he's and he's he's finally committed to the the back of birds. He now has moved most of his major entertainment piece. But um, part of the idea of creating better sidewalks is to encourage more restaurants to put tables and chairs up. Yes, ma'am. Where's the Grand Rapids Market located? Grand Rapids Market is behind um, the Van Andel Center. You, you know, I don't know what neighborhood that's called. It's it's, uh, I guess it's downriver. It's, it's towards Kalamazoo, uh, from downtown. Yeah, whatever way that way is. Thank you.